son, I love you. And if anything happens to me, you have to look after your sisters, your family. That's aged five. And that is when I lost my childhood. Because deep down, you know, subconsciously, I knew that my father wouldn't be around for long. And then within two or three minutes was that um, the jets arrived, the helicopter gunships arrived, and they started bombing the entire village. I still remember the sound of the bullets hitting the walls, the ceilings, uh, the shrapnels going everywhere, the dust. Hey everyone, it's Jake here. Listen, before we get going, I just wanted to drop in and say a huge thanks to all of our new subscribers. This channel is growing like crazy. And here's the truth, okay? The more subscribers we get, the bigger the channel becomes. The bigger it becomes, the greater the names that we can attract. So before you watch this video, please just spend five seconds hitting subscribe. It's good for us, but it's also great for you and it really helps grow this channel. Thank you so much and enjoy. Well, Wade, welcome to the High Performance Podcast. Thank you very much, uh, Jake uh, and team, for uh, having me. It's a pleasure. Let's start, as we always do. What is your definition of high performance? High performance is such a broad term, but I was thinking about it. For me, it's living a life, actually, that um, is purposeful and focused, both at the same time. And it's not easy to do that because we can find purpose in any area of life, but which direction do we go? But then for me, I've learned more how to bring my focus closer to the few areas that I can, I'm good at, um, I can make a difference in people's lives and I stick with it. And that actually brings out the best in me. I love that. So you're talking there about a sense of empowerment, of understanding the impact that you can have on the world. Let's go right back to your childhood um, when you were growing up in war-torn Afghanistan, where I guess the feeling was a very different one. It, it would have been a feeling of helplessness, maybe. So I was born in uh, into war uh, in, in the mid-80s during the Afghan-Soviet conflict. I didn't know any other reality. So the reality I was born into was listening to the sounds of the rockets, the bombs and the shellings outside uh, when whenever we would come out uh, dotted memories that I have. We would see soldiers on the street and then we'll see helicopter gunships and jets in the sky. So those are the formative years, how they've been formed in my mind. Um, amongst them, there are a couple of uh, positive memories that I have or only two happy memories that I can remember. One is being taken to a local park by my mother uh, to have an ice cream with my cousins and to have a play. And another one was when I was at home and my father came in in his military uniform. He brought in this big kite um, from outside. He kneeled down. He gave me this big kite. I was so happy because usually I would see these kites in the sky. And then for him to suddenly disappear from our life. So you can see one moment that you're living this life, which you can call normal yeah. with your family members uh, and you're trying to enjoy your childhood a little bit. But the next moment, um, uh, I, I lost my father. I didn't know where he went. That kind of symbolizes the happiness, moments of happiness, but really amongst the really dark period for people that they have to go through, whether they go into hiding from the uh, rockets, the bombs, or whether they lose their siblings or they lose their parents. And for me, that was the case. My father went into hiding from the military service uh, because that was a death sentence. He had to go to the front line to fight his uh, fellow uh, countrymen, and he didn't want to do that. So that's kind of the, the first five years. And from time to time, we would go to um, meet him. My mother wouldn't say to us that we're going to meet your father. He would be hiding in, in mountains in an area called Logar. Um, and whenever we would go there, my mother would say that we go into the villages to have some dairy products and to, to have a go on the horses and the donkeys. Um, and then suddenly we'd be staying in one room and my father would reappear out of nowhere. And that would be so magical. Uh, for one moment, three months ago, four months ago, six months ago, he would go and then the next moment he would be there. And I remember that kind of a, gazing into his eyes and sitting next to him, cuddling him. I wouldn't leave him even to go to anywhere um, because I knew that that could be another moment that he will go away and he will not come back. So can we explore that topic then of hope? 
because one of my favorite books of all time is a, is a, is a book called Hope by an author called Andrew Rizigi. And it contains so many different stories about the power of hope. But like one that sticks in my mind was some doctors that had some different pills and the different chemicals. Uh, you could rearrange the letters of them to, and they called them hope pills. And they found that in, in the medical tests that were done, the hope pills, rather than just whatever their pharmaceutical name was used, actually had a higher impact of recovery rate in patients. So there's lots of research like that contained within the book. And I'm interested in how powerful hope is and how we can all get a little bit more of it in our lives. I think I will use another part of the story, which was when we, um, to just illustrate the power of hope and the power of not giving up when you're even in the darkest hours. That was when we uh, moved to Pakistan as refugees, like millions of other Afghans who traveled in the 80s and 90s. Um, we were safe there, but the conditions were really inhumane. So we started living in a tent as a family of eight with a little toilet that was man-made outside um, and a little area where my mum and uh, my sisters could cook. But within days, most of us got malaria, which, as you know, is is life-threatening disease. And sadly, many people uh, succumbed to it, but we survived. And within three months was I started coughing. I started coughing. Uh, and with that, I started bringing up blood. I lost weight. I had night sweats. My father, he took me to a local doctor and when he examined me there um, and he said that I had to be taken to a specialist. Uh, so my father took me to a specialist in Peshawar city in one of the busiest cities in Pakistan. Um, and the specialists usually they sit in shops. So you don't go to an, you can go to a big hospital, but there was a private area like you've seen it in Pakistan and India. So he went to the specialist, he examined me. Uh, and uh, he asked uh, my father to get my x-ray of my chest. So we went to the shop next door where there was an x-ray machine. My x-ray was taken and I was so proud to have this x-ray in my hand of my body. Uh, and I brought it back to, to the specialist. He had a look at it uh, and he asked me to sit outside. So when I sat outside there, uh, I was a pretty curious child and I was trying to listen to what they were talking. Uh, and he said to my father that I had 70% chance of dying uh, because I had tuberculosis and my disease was very advanced and I had um, lost so much weight. I was so weak that I couldn't fight it. And that's when my father said, broke down in tears and he said, doctor, don't tell me the percentage of him dying. Give me the percentages of him surviving and what I can do to save him. And he said, well, I'll prescribe you medications, but he really needs to be eating well. He needs to have um, be in an environment that's a little bit stress-free. Um, so that was the, the basic prescription he gave. Uh, and my father, he being a refugee and looking after a big family, we hardly had anything. Uh, and we came back on the way. I was on his lap in this bus. He was crying all the way. I didn't dare ask him any question because I knew there was something wrong. Um, and then we arrived home. The next moment, he didn't think about the 70% of chance of dying or giving up on me. He spoke with my mother and the whole night they were crying together. But the next moment, the next morning, they were upbeat. My father went out to start work. He kept going to various parts of uh, Pakistan to collect antiques to bring in to the, the center and sell it to tourists to make some money. Uh, and my mother started cooking better food from the money that my father would bring in. So they really focused on ways to save me uh, rather than to allowing the situation to take over, which in, by any means you look at it, the odds were against me of surviving. And that was not for one or two days. It went on for one and a half year. Um, that he was out and about three, four days in a row. He would come back with some meat. Um, bananas, uh, oranges, which I still love so much. And uh, my, my wife calls me a monkey because I just keep eating <laughs> bananas. But it stems from the childhood that I, I developed that uh, keenness with it. Um, and we didn't have um, anything except a fan and the temperatures rising up to 45 degrees centigrade. So these are one of the harshest conditions you can live in. Uh, a big family. Uh, I didn't have any toys to play with. My father, he would allow me to inject boiled water into his arms 
whenever he was in, in the house and his poor arms would turn black and blue because I would kept messing the vein. In a way, he was entertaining me. He was finding ways not to give up on the environment, but he would find, um, improvise. Uh, and then it, he would go around to the neighbor's house and would you allow my son and my, my children to uh, watch your TV? And said, yeah, of course. So he... Uh, would would bring in this little ladder that we will climb over uh, and we would watch this black and white TV um, house next door. Uh, and my favorite series was the Knight Rider one. Uh, and I so wanted a replica car from that. So I think the lessons from all that that I learned and, and I use that in my life is that um, in, in the most challenging situations in life, you can easily give up or you can fight it. And that's the lesson, the biggest lesson that I learned from my father and my mother uh, and from so many of the people who've been through tra traumas of war, displacement. And then I see that, of course, I've seen people through COVID uh, exhibit the same when their backs have been against the wall, when there's, you know, the loved ones are dying, when they lost jobs, uh, relationships, um, and, and that they hang on to, to hope. So we do have that resilience in us. Uh, if we're faced with challenges, uh, extreme of challenges or, you know, challenges, maybe mild or moderate, we will, they will come out. It's just not to give up, I would say, is the, the strongest message. Can we just talk about how you ended up in, in Pakistan? You know, you've spoken about bombs falling outside your house. Would you just give for our listeners and viewers who haven't read your book, just a the most sort of graphic description you can of actually what day to day life was like in Afghanistan and how eventually that led to your parents making what is a very big decision. And again, it's a decision based on hope to leave Afghanistan for Pakistan. The situation was that um, from the first five years, most of the time we were in cellars because the rockets would be coming uh, randomly. So there was no target. And uh, they were some people, they would come in about 20, 30 kilometers away, put the huge rockets and target, okay, that's the city, we're going to hit the city. And whoever or whichever house it lands on, it lands. That is kind of, and then the other situation, of course, would be that uh, people would, would raid into areas and they would fight the opposition. But in the middle, the people who uh, were there, they would get killed or they get injured. So a lot of our time was spent in cellars. We were not allowed to go outside um, because outside it was dangerous for us. And there was one particular story that will illustrate the severity of, of, of the conflict itself, is that when we were traveling from Afghanistan to Pakistan, uh, we were traveling on donkeys and horses. And that was a journey that took seven days, seven nights. Uh, we were traveling at nighttime, like most families, because people were not allowed to even leave the country. Uh, that's one, so they couldn't take the normal borders. And secondly, we were taking a very dangerous route to mountains and valleys, uh, and that route was used by the opposition. So, there's a bit of history there as well. The people who were fighting the Russians were the Mujahideen, and they would bring in the weapons. For people who've watched Rambo 3, they will see what uh, I'm talking about there. And they uh, would bring in the weapons. So, the, the helicopter gunships and the jets from the uh, Soviet government, they would attack anybody on the ground. Uh, so, when we were traveling, there was one morning, it was a bit lighter, um, and uh, my father said that, okay, we need to stop until it's a bit darker. We need to find uh, somewhere in the local village to hide. So I insisted that I would come with my father. And so my father, along with two or three other men, they, they went to explore the village. I went with them. Uh, women, the children, they stayed under trees to get uh, to hide. Um, so we were open, so we were spotted by a spy plane. And that's when uh, my father realized that what was coming. So he grabbed me in his arm and he ran towards the village. And he didn't want to go back uh, because he didn't want the children to be exposed or the women to be exposed to, to the rocket. Uh, and when we ran to the village, he was trying to open one door, another door. And then he finally found a house that was open. And in there, he was looking for something. I had no idea what it was. And then he found an oven in the floor, uh, which was used for baking bread in, in villages in Afghanistan. So he hit me in that oven. He hit me there and he said just two sentences before uh, um, 
the, the whole um, bombardment started and, and he said it, son, I love you. And if anything happens to me, you have to look after your sisters, your family. That's aged five. And that is when I lost my childhood. Because deep down, you know, subconsciously, I knew that my father wouldn't be around for long. So I had to really forget about what playing is, what being a child is like. And then within two or three minutes was that um, the jets arrived, the helicopter gunships arrived, and they started bombing the entire village. Um, I can still vividly remember it was, you know, 35 years ago or so, uh, 34 years ago, I still remember the sound of the bullets hitting the walls, the ceilings, uh, the shrapnels going everywhere, the dust, the even even the walls coming down, I can hear the sound of it. So these are some of the traumas that people will remember forever in their lives. And that exhibits what war situation is for people who live through conflict. And the same we see in Ukraine, sadly, the same we see in Syria and many other countries is that people, that's how they, they get caught and they, they die. Uh, miraculously, we survived that attack and further two attacks along the way. But that one attack, I think, actually um, may show that how things change suddenly. And then within minutes, you're with your loved one and the next moment you're gone. Uh, you're either uh, hit by, by a rocket or a bomb and people will be lucky to even find pieces of their loved ones. I think, you know, when you hear a, a story as harrowing as that, it's so easy to imagine, well, you would just give up, you know, hope would be lost. Your your hatred of humankind would be so strong. You would think, do I even want to exist in a world like this? But having read your book, you know, as this was going on, somehow you still were able to see a future. You know, you were still learning English from the world service. You were still buying textbooks from street sellers to, to learn about the world. You know, there's a really interesting story here about the human nature not being broken by the seeing the most harrowing things a five-year-old uh, can ever witness. And for people who are listening to this, who, who maybe are feeling hopeless and feeling that, you know, life is one long story of despair and disappointment and letdown and challenge. What would you share with them that you learned in that time that you think they may well find helpful? So that was one occasion. So my 15 years of uh, my childhood was entirely spent in, in days uh, like that, um, it, whether it's refugee camps, whether it's in conflict. But it was also a lot of the time that uh, there were people helping each other. So people, when they're moving because of conflict from one region to another, they would go to strangers' house in the middle of the night. They would knock. And I remember, you know, knocking and this old lady would come out or this man would come out with a child and said, come on, come on. You would go in there. They would have one room and they would share that room with another 10 people. Uh, they would go there and and uh, have a chat, you know, where to get some bread. So they would usually save some bread for their children, for their own children, but they would share it. They wouldn't care about what tomorrow holds because they knew um, that uh, they, uh, we were there to, to be helped. So they would provide that support. Uh, even in, in the refugee camp, the doctor who helped me, uh, who he is actually the person who inspired me to become a doctor myself. I interacted with him for a year, a year and a half, but every time I would go in, he would have this intellectual conversation with me, uh, which was the only time I had something meaningful because uh, I couldn't go to school. Uh, there was no school and uh, I, I barely educated at school level. Um, wow. And so for him to see something in me, in my curiosity, and every time he would show me uh, x-rays of other people and some images of the heart, of the lung and so on. On the last visit, he gave me a, a stethoscope and a, and a large black and white textbook. And he said, um, Wahid, um, son, I think you'll be a doctor one day. You, this will be helpful. Wow. So he actually transformed my life. That's when, during wartime, I became inspired because I wanted to be like him, to heal people rather than be somebody uh, who kills people. I had a choice later on. And, and that's 
why I'm so careful when, when I see people, when I talk to them, when I interact with them online, when I speak with them in person, when they send me a text message or, or a DM, I try to reply back with, with some words of kindness. I like look up their profile and see the goodness in them genuinely, authentically. And I say, you know what? Yes, you've got this. You know, we're, we're on various uh, phases of, of our journeys and our own life. Each one has their own trajectory and we shouldn't compare. And I think life is very relative. But along that journey, um, each one has episodes of adversity, episodes of challenges and so on. But there's, this is how we can cross over with each other is, is for me is where the magic happens between humans is, but we can all do it. It's, it's, and we shouldn't compare each other, but how can we support each other is how I see it. So Wahid, was there one particular moment of kindness in the midst of that bleak um, backstory that was happening that really stands out for you? And if there was, can you describe to us the impact that it had on you? The time when I turned 15 is when um, my life was in danger my life was in danger and um, I had no choice but to leave Afghanistan. Uh, my whole family couldn't leave because it was very expensive and there was no regular route to leave Afghanistan. So my family had to sell everything and put all, all that money into the hands of an agent, which was the only way out to leave. As I would say that the biggest kindness, I know it, it, it sounds that parents would do it, is for them to sell everything and believe in me, uh, one, to save my life, and then believe in me that I would be able to figure out my future is, is, is such a hard decision. It's, it's so difficult. It's also, wait, that's also a huge responsibility yeah. on very young shoulders, isn't it? You know, a 15-year-old child still, knowing that the belief and the hope of the whole family rested on those shoulders. How did you, how did you process that? I think I was looking at the options. Um, so when, during the wartime and displacement, it was really choosing between the, the worst and the better option uh, that were available. And that's how a lot of the decisions were made by my parents. Uh, and I learned a lot about resilience from my parents and from other people who were there as well. My father, he would find hope in the slimmest possible way that he would listen to the radio there will be 99 percent negative news but he would be looking for that one point and then he will try to drum that out to to my mother who was more realistic she she was very much kind of switched on to look at the realities and what we should do and what we shouldn't do but my father was the one who was bringing in that one percent of hope and i learned that i have to actually develop his method of of uh, looking for that one or two positive steps despite what else is going on and that's how i even developed that imaginary world in my mind that um, when i was listening to to the bbc world service I would hear that people would talk about going to school, having dinner together as a family, having friends. I had none of that. But in my mind, I would create that, okay, one day I will be able to do the same. And I translated that onto the paper. So in the morning when I was motivating myself to just get by, so I would draw a picture of a school, of a table, um, of, of me having my friends, and then I'll be walking, pacing around that little place or outside, imagining in my mind what I would do next, what my rotor would look like, and so on. Uh, it, it's amazing how that has become a reality now for me, uh, uh, you know, decades later. But at that time, I couldn't see it. I imagined it, and I drew it on the paper. So what do you think that was doing for you? Because you're describing visualization that when we've spoken to athletes that performing under pressure that's a skill that they'll often tap into what do you think that was doing for you at that young age one those methods were allowing me to really hang on to hope and not to give up because i had depressive symptoms at the age of 10 12 i really couldn't make out what the world was about because i was born into war and i had no other reality understanding of the reality of a normality um, so what it did was it really gave me hope that there is reality, even though I've not experienced it and I shouldn't give up on that and I shouldn't give up on humanity. Uh, and on the other hand, what it did was it really brought my focus together from 
I left Afghanistan at the age of 15, but from the age of 12, 10, I was really focused to leave. So that took a lot of preparation. So mentally, I was looking for ways to to get out, For look, looked for ways how to educate myself uh, abroad, how to be able to save myself, how to be able to save my family there. Uh, and that uh, meant that I had conversations with people and how people go abroad, how they flee Afghanistan, um, what are the ways, uh, what would people do when they go abroad, how they can get education. So all that took a lot of few years to for me to ultimately get to a point where I found this person who sent me away from Afghanistan. So it suddenly didn't happen. But that thinking along the way, that visualization became a reality for me, because that's all I was talking about, thinking about, uh, and not giving up. If I had given up, I don't think I would be here now. And do you feel that, I mean, a lot of what you're describing as well, Wahid, it, it, like correlates with the research that on post-traumatic growth as opposed to the post-traumatic stress that we would imagine that somebody going through those experiences might might have endured the idea of being able to make some kind of sense out of those experiences allow you to move forward and progress rather than remain stuck in a certain moment what other factors do you feel that you could share with us from those quite extreme circumstances that our listeners would be able to maybe deal with something that's traumatic in their own world could take and use to be able to move move forward. Well, post traumatic growth and post traumatic stress. I think these are you know, very important terminologies, and and I think it's theoretically you can differentiate them, but in reality, when we talk about trauma, is it's even now decades later. Um, I, I get into situations where there's a risk of me being re-traumatized. Uh, for example, I do a lot of humanitarian work. I uh, advocate for mental health. So when I see stories, hear stories of other people suffering from mental health, it really brings out my own memories as well. Um, so I would say that it's, for me, learning to be at peace on reflection now with the traumas. Uh, and at that time, it was about survival. It's about, uh, I was still on a fight or flight mode. I was really high on adrenaline trying to save myself. And I was um, also in a, uh, because my, I was the eldest son, I was had to, so much responsibility on my shoulders to be able to provide for the family. So keep, deep down, that motivated me to not give up responsibility for others, for myself. I was inspired to become a doctor. So that dream of having a dream, something to look forward to, even though it was out of reach for me, but I knew that uh, one day I would be in a position to do that. And I looked for ways to, to make that dream a reality. And I, that kept motivating me each day to take one step forward, um, to find somebody to talk to, you know, how I would be able to go to, to school, how I would be able to go to university, how I would be able to live abroad. Uh, and, and each conversation, the buildup of that over months and years and making small progress here and there, was a, a let out for me from those traumas. So I didn't let my mind be consumed with what was going on. Of course, you, you have to dodge the bombs. But on the other hand, I was thinking about the future. I was thinking about ways how to be able to survive myself, save myself and to save my family. They were struggling to find food. Uh, so for me, deep down, I was thinking that if I get out, how best can I combine working and supporting my family? And that brought out the meaning and and that really gave me uh, so it wasn't just a responsibility the you know, i found meaning in life that you know if i am able to support my parents who have done so much or for my my family members my siblings who have done so much for me you know that would be amazing feeling if i can help them back so very early on i thought about giving back about compassion uh, and that really on reflection i'm talking all about reflection now because that time it was very much um adapting i would say is very much looking, uh, developing a lens to how to see the world in a different way is how I would describe that people survive conflict, they survive really traumatic experiences, and they live one day at a time, I would say. I love the, the power of reframing, and it's been spoken about on this podcast on so many different occasions because it truly is powerful for people. And I think this period in your life where you have to leave and you decide to come to the UK and you're you know, you're smuggled into the country with a hundred pounds in your pocket. And people are saying to you, look, just go and get a job as a taxi driver. Yet 
you had much bigger ambitions. You know, you had this idea of being a, a doctor. You ended up at the most prestigious university in the country. You know, having lived this war-torn life in Afghanistan, I think it's the kind of story that needs to be celebrated. But I think you should be celebrated for this point because actually up until this point, you always had that support. Your mum was there. Your family were there. You had protection around you. Suddenly, you're on your own and you still are able to do what you need to do. And I think when Damien talks about post-traumatic growth, you grew in those really difficult times when you were sitting in the oven and the floor of that tiny village, you know, being shot at by the, by the enemy. You know, you grew in those moments so that when you actually had to arrive in the UK and find your path forwards, you were able, you were able to do that. I agree with that. Uh, and I think you, you've put it so well there that um, when I arrived here in the UK, I was prepared. I was uh, prepared. And for me, well, when I landed here, I was uh, arrested, put in the back of a van and sent to prison because I didn't have the right documentation, which is, of course, I mean, the right thing to do that, you know, to look for, for the documents. But the, the, the fact is that people fleeing conflict, they can't go to an embassy to get a visa. They can't find regular routes. I looked for that and I couldn't find any. And that was the only way to be to, to save myself was to be smuggled uh, here to the UK. Uh, and when uh, and, and that's when actually I found um, a barrister who's saved me. Um, he uh, the first time I saw him in court, he uh, spoke on my behalf and he told the judge that uh, I shouldn't be prosecuted because refugees, when they're fleeing war, they should be allowed to take any route uh, according to the UN Geneva Convention. Uh, so the judge agreed with that and dropped the charges. And then my new life started when I um, was in the UK on my own without any family support, uh, hardly any formal education with $100 in my pocket. But I was absolutely beaming with excitement because I saw that the opportunities that I never had in life, the schools, uh, people trying to uh, work in, in, in various ways. Uh, I remember walking up and down on Portobello Road, the market on a Saturday morning, uh, trying to find myself this uh, shiny jacket, you know, coming from Afghanistan, we liked our shiny jackets. And so I found this uh, gray jacket and shiny green trousers and trainers. I thought that was the best combination. Uh, so that was my look for the next two years. But uh, And I thought I'm sorted in when it comes to my clothes. Let's sort out the rest. So for me, I really kind of like said, okay, this is a new life. Let me use every bit of it. Um, I started working three jobs, which was uh, being a salesman on Edgeware Road in London, uh, being a, a cleaner in Sussex Gardens, and then a kitchen porter in, in uh, somewhere uh, in, in, in the city. Um, and those are the jobs that I look for them myself. I went from one shop to another, you know, do you want somebody to work for you? And the, the fellow refugees, they advised me to just go on and work for grocery shops. But I went into a, 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 a quite a, a stylish shop that was selling perfumes and all that. And I went in. So the boss was this guy who was sitting across the table and he was interviewing me and he asked, if I had a national insurance number, I thought he was asking about my phone number. Uh, and, 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 and then he realized that actually I was so new to this country. But I convinced him, I said, listen, I'm hardworking uh, and I really need to support myself and my family back in Afghanistan. And he gave me, and that was another moment of kindness that uh, he said, you know what, you come to this uh, basement where his office was I'll, every week I'll pay you when can you start and I said I can start now and that was it he gave me the job and I stayed in that shop for three years um, even during so I combined working that job with studying at night time in the college uh, to um, in, in three different colleges to do my A levels um, you know for the audience the international audience the advanced level of the college just before getting into university so although that was extremely difficult period in terms of combining working and studying, uh, but for me, I was so excited. I was so happy to be there. I would from time to time sit um, in, in, in a roundabout and look at actually, uh, not roundabout, but somewhere in a park, and I would look into the sky and I was able to see the planes uh, that, that planes that were not attacking me. And I, I and I would look at people, the soldiers here and there, or police people, and I said they are there to protect me. They're not there to take yeah. me. Um, so kind of, I was really 
enjoying every moment, celebrating every moment. And that enabled me to work hard because those were all the things I didn't have in life. And suddenly I had them. So I didn't say, okay, I have them, you know, to try to look, oh, you know, I don't have this, I don't have that. I was really using the power of the gratitude and then combined exercise with that as well. I was very keen uh, to to do running and martial arts and and then pursuing my dream to become a doctor. Although people put me off, the fellow refugees, when I asked them, uh, you know, I wanted to become a doctor and they said, Wahid, you know, you're a refugee you really not born in this country. We know that you don't have a, a school education. So for you, the best thing to, to, to do would be to work in a chicken shop, uh, then become a taxi driver, and then maybe you might own a chicken shop. Of course, these are honorable jobs, but uh, I didn't want to become a chicken wing specialist. I want to become a, a medical specialist. So um, I then rocked up the next day to uh, find, uh, you know, for myself how to become a doctor. So I went to King's College in London to the uh, ad- admissions office. I knocked there and I said, uh, uh, I want to become a doctor. So this lady uh, came in very kindly said, are you here on an open day? I said, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what open day is, but I want to become a doctor. Uh, so she actually uh, was very kind. She showed me the prospectus and she said, like, okay, so these are the requirements I think what you're looking for. And all I did was I tore that page off and put it on the wall. To become a doctor, I needed GCAC, I needed A-levels, and I would get to university. And I blocked out all the noise outside. So for me, it was that simple. Okay, and then it was the requirement was three A's because I didn't do GCC. So I thought, let me do five A's, A-levels, and that will help me, you know, position me better in my mind when I'm competing. So instead of um, three ASs, I took five ASs. And I think that's kind of like it shows the pattern there that how I was on one hand blocking the noise outside, uh, people putting me off from my dream. And I was so driven to become a doctor because it had a meaning for me. And the meaning was that it resonated with my childhood, the, the traumas that I'd experienced, the people who I'd seen die that becoming a doctor would mean that I would be able to save people like myself, people who were suffering like I was. And also becoming a doctor would mean that I could support my family. So I really attached meaning to that target. It wasn't just, okay, I want to become a doctor, you know, have a big uh, house and car and so on. It was a lot deeper meaning. And that's another lesson that I've learned in life in whatever I do. Can I find that deeper meaning into it? In, in, in that activity. And that really allows me to look for the solutions outside the box, to look for people who can help me and for people to, uh, for me to find ways or even creative ways. And that's how innovation comes into play as well. Amazing. So how can our listeners find meaning in what they do? I think it requires a lot of reflection. Uh, it requires a lot of thinking. Um, sometimes it's quite easy to go down the route of paths that are created for us by other people. You go to school, you go to university, immediately then you can't, you you can take a gap here, more than that, you can't do that. Then suddenly you have to go down this path and before you know it, it's mid thirties, forties, you've got responsibilities and you've really that passion, that dream is really beaten out of people. And that's what I, I, I strongly disagree with is that there's a lot of pressure on people uh, right from uh, that you have to follow certain parts. Uh, and, and I worry about that is because you really taking that creativity when children, I see them, they're so creative. The, the negotiation skills, they, they, uh, my children, when they negotiate with me, you know, you do this, dad, I'll do that. And I look at them with, with joy. I say like, oh my God, you're just like so good. Uh, and my wife gets irritated, but I look at it you know, because I'm the, the play person there and she does all the hard work. Uh, but I actually see those patterns in them. Uh, so for me, sadly, a lot of the, the innovative ways that I'm thinking about or the zigzag way of looking at life comes from my childhood because all my life was in, in a very uh, different pattern. But I see why people would have to follow certain paths that are created by others. Uh, and, and a lot of thinking what their passions are, trying to explore them. Um, 
and and I think it takes a lot of time as well for people to be able to explore and it, you find out whether something is right for them or not right. If something or a path is not right for them, then they can, on the way to discovering uh, about whether that path is right or not, they might find another way, which is usually the case, uh, that they find something ultimately that resonates with them uh, and they're good at as well. So it, for me, it will be a combination of, is it something that you're really interested in? Is it something that you know, you're good at and you can become better and you can the best at it at some point is what, what I see. Uh, and thirdly, is, is there anything that can actually do to help the society? I think that's another level that I would look at things as, is it something that can provide value to other people? Uh, and that's how I narrow down the tasks ahead of me. I say, although I'm so big on compassion, but for me, I'm very big on saying no to things is because I want to focus on things that are meaningful to me, they're purposeful, and I can focus on. Because if I say yes to a task, I really want to do it in the best way possible. And I want to do it to help as many people as possible uh, with it. And if it doesn't align with the work that I'm doing, I would very politely decline it. Because, you know, for me, it's really important that it doesn't fall into the category of um, helping uh, me, my family. Does it really help the community? Uh, it, does it really inspire some people? They, you know, if a university asks me to speak or somewhere that, you know, I know that the meaning for me is not just the speaking of it or whether it's, it's a, a, a media or an international conference. Who are the audience there sitting? Maybe I can inspire another Wahid there. Somebody else is going through this trauma. So for me, that really gives me the energy to think broadly or the innovation, the mental health um, that I'm working on. Uh, it's, it's the lack of the solutions that I see, um, for example, for the trauma-informed care, uh, that there are not many uh, solutions for it, which is my new initiative, uh, the Aryan well-being that I'm working on. So it's a combination of what I'm interested in and uh, what my passion is and how can I do things to help people. And now how another level to add to that would be how can I do it differently? Yeah. Not to recreate the wheel. That's an interesting point because I think that so much of what you do is purpose driven. You know, Ariane Teleheel, which is working in conflict zones to look after people and provide healthcare. You just mentioned Ariane well-being to make sure that, you know, people are being properly supported, um, particularly with mental health care, but doing it differently. Why is why is that an important lesson for our listeners to learn from the importance of not just doing something, but doing something differently? I think that's where um I find competitions in, in uh, quite motivating as well. Um, you know, if I see that I'm doing something a bit differently um, and that adds value, not differently for the sake of it, but doing it, that it can help more people, it can um, bring more efficiency, it can really add value to, to the lives of the people who are suffering, and it can solve a problem. It becomes really motivating for me. Uh, and when I search that so many people have done it and they're doing an amazing job, I applaud them and I take lessons that, okay, well done. You, you actually embarked on this path. You're doing this work. Um, and, and what are the lessons for me? So I quickly review their work, the, the profile, individuals. That's how I keep myself motivated by so many founders by so many people who go through adversity and find, uh, you know, how do they find actually overcoming these challenges, whether it's at work, whether it's in their family, or whether it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the organizations they've founded. But then if I come across a problem that I'm passionate about, which is mental health, that I'm passionate, um, and initially it was, uh, for example, the philanthropic work that I went to Afghanistan uh, back and forth, and I saw that um, people didn't have access to specialist care. My own parents had to travel to another country to get specialist care. Um, and a lot of people would have to sell their houses or their cattle to be able to afford the journey. And by the end of the journey, they would do a couple of tests. They'll get a specialist opinion. They'll come back without any intervention. So for me, that was a big problem. And the community suffering, the severity of the problem was very, very high. Mm. And that what interested me is that even if I can work towards a solution for this, that means that it can help people tremendously. And that motivated me that I have to look for it. And 
the other aspect of motivation was that when I spoke about it here in the NHS working as a doctor, I realized that so many people wanted to help. And I saw that actually people want to help even though they don't know a stranger. So the compassion exists in the world. Uh, and I saw it amongst my own colleagues. Uh, and that was actually the beginning or the origins of Teleheal Area and Teleheal, which now connects medical specialists from the NHS and across the world to medics in Afghanistan and other low resource countries. And they provide life saving advice on an emergency front uh, on smartphones. Uh, but the origin is actually that there was a problem that I understood, the community who was suffering the problem. And ways to solve it was through collective compassion. And the technology just became an enabler. Right. Uh, and, and that is actually the key components of innovation. It's the technology doesn't come at the top. Uh, it technology quite comes lower down. And those are the lessons that I've taken now from the philanthropic work in Afghanistan and across the globe that I've done it for nearly a decade. And I'm using all those methods to solve the global mental health crisis. Uh, so for listeners, um, I'm sure a lot of them, they know already, one in four people suffers from a mental health condition. And for people who go through really traumatic experiences such as conflict, uh, it's about 22% uh, that actually they suffer from um, some sort of severe mental health condition like PTSD, anxiety, or, or depression. It's a World Health Report uh, that published that, and I was very honored to launch that myself at the World Health Organization last year, uh, these figures. So now if you look at the crisis globally, there are hundreds of millions of people who are suffering. So that's the scale of the problem that we have. And sadly, I see it firsthand how people suffer in the NHS, in the National Health Service, where I'm an a &E doctor. Every shift that I spend, I see people who are coming in who um, are trying to commit suicide, they take overdose, they drink. But there is a lot deeper problem that exists there is that, you know, they have suffered from trauma in a lot of the situations. They have deep mental health issues that are not solved uh, and they're not tackled. So the problem here in our community exists um, and globally it exists. The people who are experiencing it, they're from all ages, from mothers, from young men, elderly, children, and that's really heartbreaking for me because I can relate to them from a position of empathy uh, that I suffered from depressive symptoms when I was a child, um, 10 year old. And in the UK, I suffered uh, when I came as a, as a child refugee, I suffered from PTSD symptoms like hypervigilance. Um, I had nightmares. Um, I also had um, uh, flashbacks whenever I would look at uh, the bus. Uh, the red bus in London, it would turn into a tank for me. In the middle of the night, I would have these nightmares that a sniper would be taking my head off. So I had to open a window to see for myself that I was in London. You know, yeah. I wasn't in a war zone. And now, when I see, although, you know, not exactly the same, but I have that level of empathy for the people. And that's where my passion comes in, that I need to do something about this problem. Because the solutions that I look at really don't tackle them comprehensively. Uh, for example, in the NHS, the waiting time is nearly two years, you know, one to two years just to be able to get an assessment. And a lot of the time, actually, the assessment that happens sadly isn't done by an expert. So we're really not trying to tackle the root cause of a problem. Uh, a lot of the times, people suffer from really complex mental health issues. On the surface, you might see a bit of anxiety. You might see a little bit of depression uh, or some depressive symptoms. But deep down, when you talk to them, when they're assessed properly, there is so much going on. So for me, for example, that flashback that I explained, that symbolizes 15 years of war. Uh, so for somebody to understand, to go deep into that, which later on uh, was through a clinical psychologist, and I'm still taking therapy myself in that sense and continuing with it. It requires so much uh, knowledge, so much expertise, and that's why uh, the part of the solution is that I'm working on to bring in experts at the top, clinical psychologists with the expertise of knowledge, of knowing uh, various modalities of therapies, and then looking at that client or that patient holistically to see what the problem is. And secondly, the trauma-informed care, 
um, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the mental health conditions, uh, almost all of them, uh, or nearly all of them, they have got some elements of trauma, uh, whether people have experienced it as a child or as an adult. Uh, and third aspect is that we don't really have a lot of culturally sensitive solutions. And that worries me. When you look at populations such as the BAME populations, marginalized communities, um, even if they're not refugees, I'm talking about people who are born in the UK or have been to the US, and I've seen the black communities that suffer. But really, we don't have solutions that are a bit more tailored or, or um, experts who understand their culturally what's going on. So that's another aspect of the motivation for me, working at Aryan Wellbeing. And the final aspect is that we usually treat mind and body so separately. We think gym is for exercise and therapy is for mind, whereas it's wrong. For me, I go to gym mainly because of my mind. You know, I do it so routinely. I, you know, I get told off by my wife, I haven't done this, I haven't done that, or uh, I mess up some meetings, but I can't mess the gym because that's the one place where after two or three days when I've done, you know, heard some really horrible stories or doing philanthropic work or listening to other people suffer in A&E, but that's the one area that when I go, I feel that I have let that tension out. And there is evidence for it is that, um, you know, exercise is actually a frontline treatment for um, uh, prevention and treatment, actually, for a depression and conditions like anxiety that is not explored. So putting all that together, uh, exercise, connecting mind and body, trauma-informed, culturally sensitive, all that, uh, and put it on a smartphone or a laptop is what Aaron Wellbeing is. And that's the dream for me, for people to be able to access it anywhere uh, later on in, in, around the globe, but for now, starting in the UK. Can I just ask one last question? Because I, I, the, the, well, I'm sure we'll find a way to edit it in. I just think in the current age of where there's a narrative around asylum seekers and illegal immigrants coming in. And I think there's something around the dehumanization of the way we refer to these people on boats and that kind of political narrative. And yet so much of what you're talking about is about empathy and kindness and treating people with compassion. Can you just tell us some of your top three tips on how we can all be a little bit more empathetic towards each other? Is that, that's a very good question. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Damien. Is that re in relation to displaced people or to in relation to... Um, Just to anybody. I think empathy yeah. is, a, is a superpower that we've seen from so many of our guests. And I think you're mm -hmm. a great example of someone that both role models it, but has spoken about the benefits of being on the receiving end of that. Sure. And I think you're the most powerful person to be able to explain how we can all be a little bit empathetic. So uh, my, you know, I've been through so many traumas in my life, um, countless traumas, and, and other people, they've been through their own traumas, and we are all on our own trajectories in life's challenges, traumas. But for me, what I've discovered is that it's the compassion of other people that along the way of countless people that have transformed my life to help me to become who I am now, There's so many to name. And for me now to be able to give that compassion to other people is that it's brought meaning to my life and it's brought uh, joy, fulfillment. And I'm trying to instill that in other people in what I do. And I do believe that we all have it in us in, in one way or another. It doesn't have to be big things that we have to do, big companies or big organization. It could take actually for how we speak with each other, how we communicate with our neighbor, how we receive marginalized, how we interact with, our, in particular, with vulnerable communities, such as the homeless, such as the refugees, such as the asylum seekers. It's very easy to pick on them. The opposite is also true, is, is we can re-traumatize them more by picking on them, by weaponizing them, by politicizing them, because they don't have a voice. And that's sadly what's going on in the narrative is that it's easy to pick on refugees in the media. It's really very easy to pick on them in conferences because they don't have a platform to defend themselves. They don't have a way to tell their each individual stories which are so different. But on the other hand, we have a choice. You know, we can extend a helping hand to somebody who 
is homeless, to somebody who's got mental health problem, to somebody who's a refugee. And that is how we can actually transform our own community. And that's how I believe we can tr- bring that joy into our own lives. Phenomenal. Right, we've reached the point where we bring you our quick fire questions. And the first one is, what are the three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you should buy into? The three non-negotiable behaviours, I would say one is, for me, to be able to show compassion in what I say and in what I do. Mm -hmm. And the second one would be, and I'm learning this more and more every day, is to keep looking after myself. Because I've spent a lot of my life trying to help my family, trying to help other people. But recently I've been thinking, you know, exercise, um, therapy, eating well, and doing all the things that I preach elsewhere. And I try to do that for myself. And thirdly, I would say the third behavior would be to look for meanings in what I do. It may make it sound that I'm taking spontaneity out, but it really, it may do. But it really brings a deeper fulfillment in in even the small task. If I'm meeting someone, talking to someone, um, then that really, I enjoy that conversation more. Even coming to the podcast, I knew that if your audience is listening to this and they can maybe help two or three or four people, that would be absolutely mind-blowing for me. Very good. If you could go back to one moment of your life, what would it be and why? One moment in my life, in I would say, would be that going back to my younger self when I was trying to create this imaginary world and to dream about a better life and to say that one day things will be okay despite me uh, come, uh, living under bombs. I would go back and tell that person that continue dreaming, that dream will come true. Uh, I didn't know if it would, would uh, and but I was betting that one day it would. And I think I would just reassure him, tap him uh, on his back and say that, you know, mate, you're doing the right thing. Just stick to what you're doing and not to give up on hope. Lovely. If you could recommend one book to our listeners, we have a book club called the High Performance Book Club, and it can't be your own, unfortunately. Um, If you could recommend one book to them that's maybe made a difference for you, what would you recommend? Uh, It was the, um, I watched actually on on TV first, uh, on, on, um, I watched the film first, but then I read the book. It was uh, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Uh, So this is a book um, by William um, uh, Kamkawamba. Uh, who is a Malawian engineer. So this is a boy. It's, it's the story resonates in some aspects with my own background story. Is that he, What he did was he used the power of the wind turbine to power uh, electricity for his own house and his local uh, community. Uh, he couldn't go to school or he was kicked out of school and he couldn't afford. But it was the problem. He was so problem-driven that despite his lack of you know, expertise in engineering, he, he understood that there was a problem in the community. He worked on that and he tried to add value to the people, whether it's his own family and to local community. And that in, in a way symbolizes what innovation is about, it is about looking at a problem, uh, trying to see the people who are experiencing a problem and to do help those people. And whether he... He developed it actually from uh, parts of like, broken pieces, metal everywhere. And that shows that you don't have to have shiny technologies to make a difference. Mm. Uh, people really get wound up a lot by newer technologies coming every year and they get, can get really stressed about it. But the reality is if we stick with humanity, if we stick of how we can help each other, we will always be ahead of innovation as long as we look after each other. What's your biggest strength and your greatest weakness? I think my biggest strength now would be that probably focusing a lot on meaning um, and and trying to give compassion. But that has become a weakness as well um, in a way that I can get consumed by trying to help others. And in the process, it can really affect me as well that I forget about myself. So get that balance and right. I have many weaknesses, by the way, but I'm just bringing an example of, of uh, you know, if you ask my wife, she will, <laughs> she will list so many that uh, <laughs> she reminds me as well. You know, I can't even drive a car now. Uh, you know, I'm 39, so that's uh, 
uh, one other example, but uh, I would say the biggest one would be uh, compassion, and, and, it, and it can be a double-edged sword, I would say that. Sure. Um, I recently, I'll give you an example, I recently went and, um, uh, so I, I'm involved in this uh, docu-series that will come later this year, um, and, and I visited um, some displaced people, and after spending a week really t- trying to talk about their stories and, and see if I, how I could help them, and, and by the end of it, I was actually a bit re-traumatized because I had immersed myself so much that I had to take a week off to recover. Um, and, and although I tried to help, but, you know, the extent I went into was was really impacted me. Getting that balance right is not easy. It's something that I really tackle with. The biggest moment of failure in your life and how you dealt with it? I think the biggest moment of failure... You know, I, I failed at university as well, but I think I'm not sure if that was the biggest failure for me. I'm not sure. So I'll, I'll highlight both. So you, you can pick and choose which one you like for your audience uh, to help them, actually. The first one was that when I landed in the UK, I was arrested. Um, and at that time, actually, my whole world turned up upside down uh, because I was told that uh, I would be imprisoned for about a year, a year and a half because I didn't have the right documentation and I'd be sent back. To Afghanistan. And I think that's the time when I saw myself as a failure because um, my parents had sp- spent all their money to send me away. Uh, and I just landed here in the UK. Um, you know, I could just about touch, but I could not live it in a way to educate myself and to find a job to support myself and to help my family and to realize my dream. Yeah. And I had ruined it all. And so for people, when they, they read my memoir, they, they will know why that happened. Uh, it was because of an incident on the plane that I tried to burn my passport. So it was my fault. Um, and I nearly burned the plane with it. Um, but and why, why did you do that? Because I mind? was, uh, so I was told that uh, by the smugglers that, you know, you have to get rid of your passport when you land. You know, the, the smugglers, they, they would give you instructions and you have to follow the instructions strictly. And it didn't work for me. I was arrested. Um, so although I had, uh, you know, I'd never been on a plane, and um, I was arrested, and I thought it was my fault. And for me to, th- that was the one time that I couldn't find a way out of it in my head. Yeah. Uh, and that's probably the only time that it crossed my mind that you know, is it actually worth living if that would be the case? And I immediately erased that thought. I said, you know what? I'm sure there is a way out. And I started writing down my case in, in the prison uh, in Feltham Young Offenders Institute. So I really wrote down pages and pages and pages how I would be telling the judge the, you know, why I escaped up in Afghanistan. And my whole life, I wrote it down first there uh, and I, how I would argue and convince them that, you know, I should be allowed to stay in this country, that I would be a good citizen, that I would be somebody who would help the community. And one other example I would give is um, that I saw myself as a failure was when I got into Cambridge University. And when I started university, you know, I was there amongst, you know, best of the best in the world. And suddenly I realized that because of my lack of education, because I hadn't been to school, although I had done the A-level requirement, but I was exposed. I couldn't read as fast. Um, I couldn't actually register or listen to to the teachers because for the first time I was in a class and it happened to be at Cambridge. Uh, so for me, I was absolutely out of my depth. And, and then uh, a lot of people who struggle in the beginning at university at Cambridge, they go on to struggle for the next few years. And that well, the tutor told me that, uh, you know, you really have to look at what's going on here. Uh, but I didn't give up on that. So what I, I knew deep down, and I couldn't even tell my tutors that I hadn't been to school, because on my application I said I have been to school in Afghanistan. I didn't. They didn't inquire about it too much. So I, I said some white lies there. Um, but then what I did was I found a way to speed read. I found a way to be able to uh, read large amount of information. Because what I was trying to do was to memorize everything, which I thought was the way forward, and it wasn't. And, and I, I spent so many nights on my own working out how to read, how to learn how to learn. 
and 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 that allowed me actually to get a first in my third year uh, for my research project because I didn't give up on it in that sense. But I was a failure because I couldn't um, uh, compete with them. Uh, I, I got a third class in my first year. I failed subjects. And um, there were students I couldn't even interact with because my social skills were absolutely non-existent. And uh, I was struggling with PTSD as well. So the combination of all that at university came at me uh, so hardly. Uh, that, But I still kept on with my usual tested methods, which was gratitude, which was being thankful for being at university, being thankful for being in the UK, to be safe, being thankful to to help my family, uh, combine that with exercise and knowing that one day I will make it as a doctor. Amazing. It's incredible. So the final question then, Wahid, is what is your one golden rule to live in a high-performance life? One golden rule for me to live a high-performance life would be that we have one life. And for me, to make the most of it, for me, that one... I reach to a stage towards the end of life is that I can reflect on and I can be proud of that I've helped a few people along the way. It's something that would make me very proud and I just stick to that rule. I love that. Can I just say thank you so much for your story, for your honesty, for the resilience for you've shown. And I think you are a great um, example to people that you can have the hardest start in life, but your future isn't determined. And despite everything that you went through and everything that was thrown at you and all of the, the traumas that you had to deal with, you know, the fact that empathy and compassion is still central to what you do it is, it speaks, speaks volumes about you as a person. Thank you so much. I'm really honoured. And I think it was, um, it's not easy always, but I, I found that, you know, going to the stories, it requires level of compassion from you guys as well. Uh, and I think that's uh, you as a team, you've made me, you've allowed me to bring out that authenticity. And uh, so I have to thank you. Hey guys, it's Jake here. Listen, before you go, please do me just one favor hit subscribe. It makes such a difference to us. The more subscribers we get, then the bigger the channel becomes, the bigger the channel becomes, the bigger the names we can attract and the more impact we can have for you. So thanks for watching and please subscribe right now.